the agenda for today. We've got quite a lot to cover. Okay. We will be doing an overview on the industry proving grounds, 2024 hurricane season, seasonal outlooks, prediction, and long-term climate change, climate change and hurricane activity. We also are going to hear from our National Hurricane Center. Um, and so thank you in advance, Chris, for taking the time in the middle of hurricane season. We also have hurricane and tropical storm data that he's going to cover on behalf of KenNAP. We will get into a five minute break, which we ask please be prompt with the five minutes because then we'll get into the group breakouts. So with that, I am pleased to pass over to Mike Brewer from NOAA National Centers for Environmental Information. All right, thanks, Jenny. Um, so good afternoon or good morning or good night, depending on where you are. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I know your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending it with us today. Uh, we are here to hear from our industry partners and to become better acquainted with their challenges and needs, but also to answer the mail on some of the things that they've asked us for in the past. So if you would go to the next slide, please. As we get started, I want to get a little bit of a feel for the audience. Uh, since this day is focused on hurricanes, I wanted to drill down just a little and see which part of the hurricane issue NOAA can help with uh, is of the most interest to our partners. So uh, if your email does not end in NOAA.gov, which means NOAA folks, please don't participate. This is for the industry folks. Um, we want to take a little poll uh, and uh, on the slide here, you'll see down in the, the right-hand corner, there's a series of triangle, circle, and uh, square. Hey, passed my kindergarten shape test there. Um, if you click on that, there will be an option for poll. Uh, and if you jump into that poll, you can choose uh, whichever option uh, you want there. And we'll let this run for just a few seconds, uh, just to kind of get a feel for where everybody is. Um, so that we make sure we hit the right things uh, as we move forward. So again, non-NOAA folks, please uh, love to hear from you. Uh, get your input on here. <clears throat> All right. Very good. So we'll keep moving. Looks like the popcorn slowed down just a little bit uh, as we move forward there. And um, kind of unsurprising in conversations that we've had before, uh, kind of split between data and information access and uh, climate change and its impacts uh, kind of leading the way um, with uh, some other information. Uh, the other two options, uh, getting a few less votes. So thank you, that, that's great confirmation uh, and we appreciate that. All right, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, if we're good there. Um, so for those of you I haven't met yet, and I'm sure there's some of you on the line, uh, my name is Mike Brewer. Uh, I'm part of NOAA at the National Centers for Environmental Information, and I am the NOAA manager for the Inflation Reduction Act Industry Proving Grounds. Uh, and I want to take a minute to frame that work since that's part of why we're all here today. Um, so this effort, the IPG effort, the Industry Proving Grounds effort, is focused on improving the information we get into the hands of our industry partners, as well as transforming how we get that information into their hands for use. Um, today's discussion is gonna be focused uh, on the parts of the tropical systems that IPG can play a part in. Uh, I wanna acknowledge uh, upfront that this is not all of NOAA that thinks about hurricanes. Uh, this is the part specific to IPG, but I wanna acknowledge the great work that happens uh, in other parts of the organization. Um, uh, so we do have partners here, just so you know, from our National Weather Service uh, and from our uh, NOAA research arm, uh, in addition to some of our social science uh, partners in NOAA, um, in addition to the folks here at NCEI who think more about the data and information handling. Um, if there's something on your mind that would fall to someone who is not part of the discussion here from NOAA, We'll be happy to facilitate uh, getting you together with the right people to get you the answers that you need kind of as we move forward after this webinar. So if you go to the next slide, please. So in the industry proving grounds in IPG, we're basically focused on four major areas. Uh, we call three of them work streams and they're all underlaid by uh, continuous engagement. So work stream one is uh, website development or 
a one-stop shop for environmental data for the sector. Uh, Workstream 2 is focused on data formats, data availability, getting information in the right formats, in the right way uh, to folks who need it for their models, uh, for their applications, whatever the case may be. And Workstream 3 is focused on product development. Product development being what new things do you want in the products that we have? What new products do you need that we don't have uh, that we might be able to spin up to address your questions uh, as we move forward? Um, and I want to um, hammer on the engagement uh, slide, the engagement underlying, underlying piece there. I know that many of you have been on uh, calls with us before in, in IPG, um, and thank you for that. Uh, but the key part is we want to do this with you. We don't just want to do this for you. Um, so that engagement is absolutely key uh, to what we're doing. So if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, so on this slide, on the left-hand side, it says our commitment, and that's kind of code word for this is what we thought we have heard from you through the years or through the decades that we've uh, been partnering together in some cases, or through the more recent conversations that we've had kind of under the IPG uh, banner. Um, and those things boil down uh, into a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, we want to understand what NOAA has, what's in your catalog of stuff that we might be able to take advantage of. That's part of the reason that we're all here, to show off some of our hurricane wares. Um, you wanted to be included in the process uh, and the progress and inform research and priorities as we move forward uh, with our work in NOAA. Um, two, you want to have access to NOAA expertise and scientists to be able to have a conversation, ask questions, and get insights. Another part of why we're here today. Um, and uh, the last one is uh, to look for common threads that raise all boats across sectors, not just the ones that we were handed in IPG, but with other partners as well. So on the right-hand side, NOAA hopes to get a few things out of this too, um, just to say these up front. Uh, we want durable improvements, uh, make our products and delivery more reliable uh, to everyone. Uh, we want to prioritize needs. Um, that are gonna make the biggest impact on our partners and our users. We want to ensure that equity resilience and driving prosperity are included in the decisions now that we make so that we have an impact into the future. And we certainly want to um, gain your support. Uh, we wanna be able to continue to provide these things for you moving into the future, uh, not just through uh, some of these short-term supplemental activities uh, that we're uh, focused on right now. Uh, but what are the durable things that we can continue to do for you as we move forward? Excuse me. Next slide, please. Uh, we're also trying new ways of developing and delivering information. Um, and this is an example of uh, one piece in the arena we're calling uh, let's fail fast. Let's try something and fail fast. Uh, either succeed wildly or, or give up on something um, and change tactic. Uh, so we're partnering a couple of strategic partnerships. One, we have a partnership with NSF to do some research that's uh, focused on the catastrophe modeling uh, improvements uh, for the insurance and reinsurance industry. Uh, two, we're working with the Department of Defense and uh, with a company called Climate AI on some improvements into the hurricane information that we've had. And we just got some uh, hot off the shelf uh, information from them uh, that I wanted to just mention here, uh, and then we'll see about tying uh, industry folks together uh, with them to to see if there's things that they can help with. So the focus of what's going on with with climate AI and with Department of Defense, the things that overlap and and what we're looking for are things like floods, precipitation, landfalling, hurricane outlooks, right? Um, reinsurance, for example, insures assets. Uh, the military has bases, and they have buildings on bases and F-35s on bases, and, and they've got very similar kind of needs to know uh, around precipitation, flood information specifically, uh, whether it's uh, tropical or non-tropical, uh, where you might want to uh, put those or what the, what the impact of some extreme event might be on those uh, so that you could potentially mitigate it uh, in, uh, ahead of time. Uh, and another thing is uh, improve the specificity of the data that could be included in catastrophe models. Could any of this data from climate AI make it into a catastrophe model to give a more uh, accurate uh, 
prediction uh, for what's going to happen in in the future in that catastrophe modeling space uh, that would help industry activities and operations. Um, so th this on the right hand side, the, the map that we're showing, one of the things that Climate AI uh, has given us this week that I haven't had a lot of time to, to dive into um, is a landfalling hurricane uh, probability outlook. So that's what you're seeing here that runs through November. Um, it's really hard to see the, the scale there, uh, but the probability is down to 0.3 or so by the time it disappears. Um, for the season, a one in three chance uh, of a landfalling hurricane moving up through the Mississippi uh, and up along the Northeast. So happy to talk more about that in the breakouts if we, uh, if folks are interested, uh, or we'll certainly sweep into those conversations moving forward. And next slide. Uh, and another, this is hot off the presses. Uh, we have a website stood up for you, that one-stop shop. Uh, that I mentioned before, noaa.gov slash climate hyphen industry. Uh, it is active, it is live now, it is a stub out uh, that we need your help to flesh out and put the stuff that is important to you on that website uh, to include the tools that you need to interact with the information and with the data and to put access into that data there as well. So uh, check it out, bookmark it, uh, and help us make it something that is useful to you. Okay, so with that, I'm finished. That's enough programmatics. Um, I know you didn't come here to hear me talk about the program. You came here to listen to the smart people, uh, our science experts, uh, and the real topics that you're interested in. But I'm happy to take any questions later, uh, probably in the breakout sessions as we move forward. So with that, Jenny, do I hand back to you? Thank you very much, Mike. That was a really great overview of the NOAA industry proving grounds. I left the link to the newly launched website here in the chat. Uh, please check it out. In the room and in the call today, we have participants from industry, from NOAA, from a number of different parts of NOAA. We have solution providers. But most importantly, I want to recognize and celebrate our partners with the associations with retail, architecture, engineering, and insurance reinsurance. Um, if you are part of those organizations or industries or solution provider, please give us a thumbs up as I transition over to our next speaker. I know there is more than one of you. I know. I see you. Thank you. There you go. Appreciate it. Um, it's with your input that we have been able to mobilize really fast and put together a website where hopefully you will start to see more of your industries information and requests for information specifically on the noaa.gov slash climate hyphen industry website. All right, Matt Rosencrantz, take it away. Tell us about what's happening this year with hurricanes. Uh, yeah, so we talk about the 2024 hurricane outlook um, and then more specifically kind of uh, get into details about these outlooks in general um, to see how they can be useful uh, to the different, uh, and to everyone on the call or how they think they can be useful. So uh, next slide. Um, the hurricane season outlooks from NOAA, um, I'm the lead for those, and they are, they come out of the Climate Prediction Center, um, but they are a collaboration with the National Hurricane Center, um, the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, there are different divisions there, um, as well as the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. Um, and then eventually I do also get into the outlooks with the for the West Pacific um, with the Weather Forecast Office in Guam. Um, they, they lead that for now. Um, so we do kind of do outlooks that go around, even the South Pacific, American, America and Samoa. Um, so we do get around the, the globe for these outlooks for places that NOAA has legal, kind of legal responsibility for. Um, next slide. So this is our outlook for the 2024 hurricane season um, We from May. Um, we are going to update this on August 8th of this year. So um, there's a little, little tease for you to tune back in then. Um, but the outlook for this year and for all the years, um, it's generally presented in this format, the range of named storms, the number of hurricanes, uh, number of major hurricanes, and then our total seasonal uh, measure is the accumulated cyclone energy. Um, that's the wind speed from every advisor at the National Hurricane Center puts out, um, convert it to knots, square it, and then add it all up for the entire season. 
Um, so that way it gives you a total measure of kind of how much energy was in any storm over at any point and then adding that all up. Um, we also give probabilities um, and you'll kind of see why we give the probabilities for the different seasons as we get through the presentation. I can talk more about how some of those uncertainties are arrived at and assessed. Uh, next slide. One of the things we look at are the sea surface temperatures. And for this year, um, we are looking at well above normal sea surface temperatures. This is from April, 2024. Um, so those sea surface temperature across the Atlantic and the tropical part of the Atlantic um, and that green box there, they're at 1.2 degrees Celsius centigrade. Um, they were warmer than 2023, which set the previous record. So for much of this year, we've had a record warm sea surface temperatures. Um, and then so these slides, you know, that's that's one of the factors that goes into there. We're also looking at El Nino the, or La Nina, um, the conditions in the Pacific because that changes the wind patterns and the over the entire planet. Um, not, a, not instantaneously, but as we watch that transition in the Pacific, those sea surface temperatures it will start to change the wind flows, the jet streams around the planet. Um, almost like if you're trying to boil a pot of water, but you had one flame and you kind of move that flame underneath the pot of water, where would that next kind of bubble come up? Um, and as those sea surface temperatures change, that's kind of like moving that, moving that flame underneath the pot. Uh, so next slide. We're also looking at upper level and lower level winds. So the left panel here is the winds at about 5,000 feet off of the surface of the ocean. And the right panel is the winds at about, about 40,000 feet. Um, so the left panel there shows that we can see some highlighting of reduced trade winds over the Atlantic, kind of where the green box and the blue oval kind of overlap. So we're always watching that area for where the trade winds um, could be weaker or could be stronger. Um, weakened trade winds, have feedback to the ocean that keep it warmer um, and they also reduce the vertical wind shear which allows any any kind of wave coming off of africa or along a frontal boundary um, to potentially develop into a tropical storm um, again these are a little bit older plots these aren't current um, these are just samples of how the kind of analysis that we do um, we're also looking at the top of the atmosphere which is the right hand side um, orange warm color plots in there represent where air is kind of coming together in the upper levels and then sinking throughout the rest of the atmosphere. Um, and then the green panel, green and cool colors in the right where the air is rising and thunderstorms rise, like rising motions, thunderstorms, more thunderstorms become tropical depressions, become tropical storms, become hurricanes. So that's the kind of the feedback mechanism that we're looking for areas where that's happening. Um, next slide. When we put it all together, we do have some graphics that come out like this that are kind of more easily digestible and shareable than the prior um, intense technical graphics. Um, this is kind of a summary slide that I produce um, every year based on the, um, you know, just the conditions that we've seen and that the team at the Hurricane Center and the Climate Prediction Center that we all assess and the conditions there. Um, I have some, you know, we're always working on these versions of these graphics. Uh, so feedback that makes them more digestible, more interpretable, absolutely let us know. Um, next slide. For the real technicals on what gets into this forecast, we are using statistical methods up top, um, multiple linear regressions. I'm testing some AI neural net methods for that. Um, we do look at the second method there, which is the binning activity, which is really like analogs. Um, working with the Atlantic Oceanographic Meteorological Laboratory, their regression scheme is looking at early season and late season and how to split that up or early versus late loading. Um, eventually, we're going to look start to look at landfalls within a research project with them as well. Um, then we take some of the forecast models um, that we have the you know the supercomputer models, um, run them out, and then we statistically correct them and relate their fields, um, such as that wind shear, the sea surface temperature patterns, and that kind of outward and inward motion of the upper atmospheres. We relate that to storm activity, um, and then use that. For, you know, do that for the past 30, 40 years and then say, OK, now if we had those conditions, what would those be this year? And then we also have some high resolution models. That's just the same models that you see every day on the, you know, that we see a lot um, just run out further in time, um, and including our, our partners, uh, European Center and UK Met as well. Uh, next slide. Some of the things we're looking at, the sea surface temperatures um, from the different models. The upper left has about 100 of our dynamical model runs into it. Uh, the upper right has about 50. Um, bottom right, the multi-model is uh, collaborated by the uh, WMO. Um, that has hundreds of, of model runs that go into that one. Um, 
So in, GFDL has their own internal research models that they also run, they share with us. Um, Hero, uh, the next speaker will get on to that and talk, I'll let, leave that the specifics there for him. Um, but I'm always appreciative of the model and the timing and analysis that, analysis that they do um, to help us get a better look at the seasonal hurricane outlooks. Uh, next slide. Um, something else we look at, definitely we have a, this climate forecast system that's internal to NOAA. Um, well, we make it external, but it's, it's NSEP's climate model. Um, and so we'll look at how that compares, um, how the patterns compare. Uh, we do pattern correlation analysis between that and the North American Multimodel Ensemble, which is the model. It's about 100 members, and that's got members from NASA. It's got members from Canadian partners, too, as well. So there's a lot of different models, and they want to write. It's a giant multi-model, many, many different models. And the one on the left is our internal version. Um, and that has about, that one has 32 members in it, if I remember right. Uh, so next slide. Uh, we're also looking at the official outlooks of the El Nino um, for this coming up. Um, the year when we made this forecast back in May, we had a 77% chance of being in a La Nina state um, by August to October, the peak of the hurricane season. Um, I know the hurricane season runs first of June uh, through the end of November, but you get 90% of your tropical storm and hurricane activity in August, September, October, and you actually get about 75% of it after August 20th. Um, so really August, September, October are really those key periods to forecast for most of the season. A lot of the stuff outside of there is um, largely noise uh, when you look at it across a long-term time scale. So, We'd like to get some signals in there if we can, um, and we're always looking at that. Can we get a, a for, make a forecast for the early season or late season? Um, but it's really tough because many years there's only one or two storms, and many years there's zero. So you have, kind of have no data to work with there. Um, right side, we're also looking at the uh, model predictions. Um, this did not translate to Google Slides so well. <laughs> so and then there's uh, we have a lot of stuff on the on the other a lot of the models on the right hand side there you can see that go into it same models that were in the spatial plots of the sea surface temperature we talked about before um, just a different way of looking at them to see their evolution in time throughout the period uh, next slide um, we're also looking at the taking the NME and hybridizing it so this takes these large scale patterns kind of global patterns of wind. Um, the sea surface temperature and combines them into a method, a uh, regression method that figures out the number of storms. It also does predictions on the amount of shear and predictions on the sea surface temperature scale as well. Um, so we're always looking at these methods, taking them in turn, you know, how can we analyze the model data that we do have already um, that's coming out of the operational data streams um, and make the most use of that kind of data mining there as well. Uh, next slide. We do run an internal high resolution version of the climate forecast system, which is at three times the resolution of the operational version. Um, that allows us to track individual storms. That's what's on the right. Um, so that's six different members, six different model numbers on the right. And over the course of this hurricane season, you can see where model number one, member number one created 16 storms, another member, um, in the bottom middle created 23 storms and we can look across the range of those possibilities to get um, an assessment of the range of storm activity um, we can also the plot on the left also lets us look at the temporal variability of this throughout the season are we going to have a late peak an early peak um, are we looking for a broad flat kind of peak where we get a lot of you know we get some early activity and then kind of just very steady activity throughout the season um, so that can, you know, kind of aid in the messaging for preparedness a little bit. Um, so that's the kind of things that we're looking at. We're making the forecast for timing and for ranges of activity. Uh, next slide. We're also looking to put it in context of history. Um, we want to know which years um, kind of had the same kinds of activity in the past to give people a context for that. Um, it's a little tricky, though, because you may have a year with a lot of storms that stay out to sea and don't have a lot of impact on the land, we may have a, have a lot more on maritime and shipping, um, or you may have storms that are maybe further southerly storm tracks, or you can have three landfalls on the east coast of the U.S., um, given all the same exact kinds of conditions. Um, but it is helpful to couch the, num the amount of activity um, versus the past, 
um, just so people can understand what they're kind of, they should be looking at for that year, how many storms are they likely to be bigger and more intense and longer lived, things like that. Um, so that's where the outlooks, giving the historical context, it also lets us look at trends and stuff too. Um, are we seeing significant trends? So next slide. It's kind of something we're looking at here. This slide, the blue is the fraction of, of hurricanes that became major hurricanes. Um, and then the orange is just the number of hurricanes. So if you look at the number of hurricanes that hasn't really changed that much over time, the fraction of hurricanes that became major hurricanes, there's a very slight uptick in that when you just do this linear trend. Um, but that's really sensitive to the starting and ending point. So it's basically a flat trend. There's very little signal in how many more storms are becoming category three, four, or five than versus the total number of hurricanes, uh, at least in the analysis and the data that I have. Uh, next slide. When we look at major hurricanes, the total overall amount, um, that line has a positive slow to it, but I want you to show it stays basically between two and three um, for this entire plot. So you're looking at, and that may be just the results of better technologies um, able to, with the satellites able to see into the hurricanes and the, the better technologies in the back of the hurricane hunters, they can actually pick out those high winds now. Um, so there's really no discernible trend in the number of major hurricanes um, that I'm seeing either from 1950 to, to 2023. Um, as far as when you take into account the total number of storms that make major hurricane uh, status. Um, so next slide. Uh, so we make these forecasts, right? But we always get asked, how do they do? Uh, why should we believe you? <laughs> it's a common question that, that prediction people get. Um, so we make effectively four forecasts, total number of storms, hurricanes, major hurricanes, and ACE. Um, and last year we were correct in the range of seven out of eight of those categories, where we had 20 named storms, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes. Those values all fell within our forecast range from the beginning of the season in May, except for the total number of named storms, which beat us by was our forecast range is a little bit too low. Uh, and it was also an interesting year last year because the fraction of named storms, so we had 20 named storms, only seven became hurricanes, so about one third. Typically, you expect that number to be between 40 and 45 percent of named storms make hurricanes, and then another 40 percent of those hurricanes become major hurricanes. That's your long-term statistic on it. Um, but last year was a little bit different. Um, so it's interesting. I've got some research on my screen, on one of my other screens, uh, about why and what happened last year. Uh, next slide. Um, so just verification thoughts. We do have this information. Um, so you can see our in the on the left-hand panel here, that's for named storms. The darker vertical bars are the August range. The lighter vertical bars, the light blue ones, are the May range, and then the symbols for what actually happened. Um, so we go through this every year, what did we forecast, how did we count them up, everything like that, and how did it verify. Um, next slide. We do this for all the variables as well. Um, you can see here that major hurricanes seems to have a little bit more variance outside of the uh, range there. Uh, so next slide. When I add that all up, um, you can see that the name storms, this is the percentage of times that we were hitting correctly. Um, so, and our goal for this is 70%. Um, so you can see for hurricanes, we get pretty, in May, we get pretty close there. Major hurricanes, we're actually doing a little bit better than our goal. Um, the total cyclone energy um, from May is, is the, currently the weakest category that we have. Um, that's the one with the most variance and variability year to year. So it kind of makes sense that that would be kind of the hardest um, thing to get. So because if you have an error in number or if you have an error in intensity, both of those errors compound up into your accumulated cyclone energy error. Um, we're always comparing ourselves to our standard, our, our deviations and ranges and biases and all the statistics to what we actually observe. Um, an interesting thing is that most of our forecast ranges, um, while they are wide, um, they're actually skinnier than what you'd expect. They're skinnier than the standard deviation from observations. Um, so the fact that our ranges are more narrow, but our forecast hit rate is about the same as we'd expect, the 67% or what, you know, two standard deviations. Um, it shows that this, the shift in the signal and the mean is doing pretty good within the tools. Um, so these are the things, if you're more curious about these, ask about them later. Uh, so next slide. Um, and that's it. So I will pass it off to Hero, my colleague. Hi. Um, 
My name is Hiro Murakami. I am a research physical scientist at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. My research focuses on the prediction and the production of the future tropical cyclones. So today, I will talk about the hurricane seasonal outlook associated with climate change. Next slide, please. So NOAA GFDL develops dynamical models for assessing predictability and the prediction scale in extreme events like tropical cyclones on a seasonal to decadal time scale. We use SPEAR and high floor dynamical models for experimental re real time and retrospective seasonal predictions and support National Hurricane Center and the Climate Prediction Center at NOAA with their hurricane seasonal outlook since 2017. NOAA GFDL was the only US institution that provided dynamic seasonal hurricane forecasts. However, as Matt mentioned, the recently developed CFS highlights model is also another dynamic model that supports NOAA's hurricane seasonal outlooks. GFDL SPEAR and high floor models show high scaling forecast in North Atlantic tropical cyclones with correlation coefficient of about plus 0.7 between observation and predictions from July first forecast. Okay, next slide, please. The GFDL sphere and high floor models predict an extremely active hurricane season for this summer, as shown in the light table. As a predicted number of named storm, hurricanes, major hurricanes, and accumulated cyclone energy are very consistent with the NOAA seasonal outlook as seen in the left figure and as Matt showed in the previous pre presentation. Next slide, please. So we speculate on three major factors for the upcoming active 2024 hurricane season. A, La Nina condition, B, warmer tropical Atlantic surface ocean, and C, warmer off the coast of North America. However, the open question is which of these factors contributed the most to the active 2024 hurricane season? Next slide, please. To answer this question, we conducted a realized seasonal forecast experiment by modifying sea surface temperatures using the GFDL SPEAR model. First, we removed La Nina conditions, applied the modified sea surface temperature to the model, and conducted the same seasonal hurricane predictions. If La Nina conditions favor Atlantic named storms, removing La Nina should result in fewer named storms compared to the original 2024 predictions. So we found about 16% reduction in named storms by removing La Nina indicating La Nina plays a role for the active hurricane season. Similarly, removing the warmer sea surface temperatures in the tropical Atlantic and off the coast of North America also showed a reduction in predicted named storm. However, however, we found that the warmer tropical Atlantic is a major contributor to the active storm season. Next slide, please. Another open question is how much global warming or climate change contribute to the to such an active hurricane season and whether we will see more active season in the future. To answer this, we conducted additional idealized seasonal experiments. We estimated projected future sea surface temperatures from multiple climate models and added them to the 2024 summer sea surface temperature anomaly to mimic the 2024 summer, but in the warmer future climate. So we consider the SSP2 4.5 mitigated emission scenario and the SSP5 8.5 high emission scenario and conducted seasonal predictions under these future conditions. Next slide, please. So the figures show the differences in name storm density between the future simulation and the actual 2024 predictions. Despite the significant increase in the sea surface temperature in the future, both future experiments reveal unchanged or decreased number of named storms compared to the actual 2024 predictions. We found that other factors 
such as increased atmospheric stability will reduce the number of named storms as CO2 levels rise. Next slide, please. So now my talk shifts from seasonal prediction to climate simulations using the SPEAR model. So we conducted multiple historical and future ensemble climate simulations from 1921 up to 2100, including anthropogenic forcing such as greenhouse gases, aerosols, ozone, and dust. The bottom six panels show the simulated and projected number of named storms for various emission scenarios for various ocean basins. So we found that named storms will decrease in most ocean basins, including the North Atlantic in the future. The North Atlantic plot suggests that we may currently be at the peak of storm activity when viewing the time series from 1921 and 200 to 2100. But we can see a significant increase in named storm since 90, 1980 up to now. So another open question is why the number of named storm has increased over the past 40 years. Next slide, please. So we found that changing the anthropogenic aerosol have behaved differently from increases in CO2 regarding the North Atlantic storms over the past 40 years. The top left uh, panel shows the observed trend in storm density by observation showing increasing in Atlantic storms over the past 40 years. Whereas the light top panel shows a similar trend by the model experiment in which both CO2 and also changes are included. The bottom left panel shows the climate simulation that only include aerosol changes in the past 40 years, revealing a substantial increase in Atlantic storms, which contrasts with the light bottom panel showed, showing that only the CO2 increasing is included and it shows that decreasing over the past 40 years. Next slide, please. So we expect CO2 levels to increase in the future, but we don't anticipate changing the anthropogenic aerosol in the North Atlantic in the future. So this suggests that the trend observed over the past 40 years may not serve as a proxy for the future, indicating a substantial reduction in named storms due to the dominant effect of CO2 in the future. Okay, next slide. So this is the key takeaways. The NOAA GFDL models predict an active hurricane season this summer, with tropical Atlantic warming being the key factor. And second, the number of uh, the number of North Atlantic named storms is projected to decrease in the future by GFDL SPEAR model due to the dominant effect of increasing in CO2. The past 40 year change in North Atlantic named storms may not be applicable to future trend. With that being said, so I am happy to accept any question and comment. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the long-term climate change. Uh, I know Hiro was presenting some uh, some future projections, some uh, some simulations from a model, some data. I want to look at even even more data uh, because if the key question here is whether greenhouse warming is changing. Uh, Atlantic hurricane activity or not, and if so, how? So we would expect, if it is, it would show up as some type of long-term trend. Uh, we see lots of year-to-year uh, -year variability in the Atlantic basin, some multi-decadal variability, but we're looking for that long-term trend to see if there's evidence uh, for a greenhouse warming signal uh, to emerge. So here are some key indices going all the way back to 1880 for, that are relevant for Atlantic hurricane frequency. The top curve here is global mean temperature, and this has this very significant rising trend. We, uh, Climate scientists have detected a greenhouse uh, warming influence on global mean temperature with very high confidence. We've also detected with high confidence a, an anthropogenic uh, signal in the tropical Atlantic. There's more multi-decadal variability about the trend in the tropical Atlantic, but there's still a rising trend. Now, when we looked at raw hurricane counts, this blue curve, in the uh, Atlantic Basin going back to the 1800s, we saw initially a rising trend, a bit like tropical sea surface temperatures. 
Uh, but on the other hand, the orange curve here shows U.S. land falling hurricane activity with no trend really over time, uh, in contrast to the raw hurricane counts. Uh, we think that a, a, a particular uh, reason why we get this different behavior between U.S. land falling and raw hurricane counts is we think there were very likely missing hurricanes in our data set, in the blue data set, that there were actually more hurricanes in the pre-satellite era than are showing up in the record. Uh, the red curve is our attempt to adjust for this pre-satellite uh, data. And in the red curve, where we make some adjustment for changes in observing capabilities, now we no longer uh, see a rising trend. It looks a lot more like U.S. landfalling hurricane activity. Uh, a sea level rise, of course, we're going to be very concerned about because climate scientists have detected a human influence on uh, sea level rise. When you have higher sea level, that means that whatever hurricanes you have, they're going to be riding in on this higher background sea level, and that's going to increase the risk of flooding, inundation, uh, all other things equal. So even if we assume there's no change in hurricanes, we're still expecting some increase in flooding, coastal flooding potential just out of the sea level rise effect. Okay, looking now at uh, major hurricanes and hurricanes, these longer term records. So we have in the top row here, U.S. landfalling hurricanes on the left, U.S. landfalling major hurricanes on the right. Really no trend in either of these. In fact, there was a big gap, and there was a big hiatus of major hurricanes there uh, in the early, uh, early 2000s. Um, now, if you look at basin-wide hurricane activity, uh, her, um, that, of course, shows this trend over time, and the trend is also there in major hurricanes. So in the basin-wide trend in major hurricanes and hurricanes, but here's our adjusted uh, time series at the bottom where we tried to make some allowance for the changes in observing capability. In this case, now we see no longer any long-term trend in major hurricanes. Again, this is just an estimate, but our estimate is showing no long-term trend in major hurricanes. Uh, similar to the case for the U.S. landfalling hurricanes, which had no trend. But we do see these pronounced multi-decadal variations. So major hurricane counts were quite low in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, it was almost like there was a, a, a uh, sort of a vacation from hurricanes for a few decades. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. So this is the U.S. landfalling power dissipation index. Again, just another measure of hurricane activity. No real trend over time. Uh, there have been uh, uh, changes in the Atlantic Basin, especially since 1980. Uh, here's the number of uh, the portion of storms that are undergoing rapid intensification, this time series on the left. That's been increasing since 1980. A lot of things have been increasing since 1980 in the Atlantic Basin. We're just not sure how representative uh, any trend since 1980 is of uh, the long-term trend, as we saw in the case of major hurricane frequency, there was a lot of multi-decadal variation when you went back prior to 1980. We did test this trend against model simulations of natural variability, and we find that the observed trend is right at the edge of what we might expect from natural uh, from natural variability. So there is a suggestion uh, in the data of an emerging greenhouse uh, warming positive trend in rapid intensification, but we're not sure yet because that depends on our model simulation of internal variability and so forth, and and the and the observations are just kind of at the edge of the distribution. So we're we're watching that carefully. This is I'll just return to Hero's uh, work a little bit, trying to explain why things have been increasing since 1980. And of course, Hero showed how uh, in observations there is a rising trend in the Atlantic Basin in tropical cyclone frequency, in contrast to many other basins. Uh, and why was that the case? And he also was able to simulate that with his model. And he's able to simulate uh, some rise in Atlantic uh, tropical cyclone frequencies here in the red curve. That's his sim simulation with all of his forcings, similar to the observations which had that rising trend since 1980. But you see how different this rising trend since 1980 is compared to the future evolution, as Hero was showing. This model is predicting. Uh, that greenhouse warming in the, over the 21st century, when greenhouse warming begins to dominate, is going to dominate over the, any of this sort of shorter term uh, aerosol driven increase, and we'll see the true greenhouse 
uh, warming signal emerge, his model is predicting a decrease um, over the 21st century. Uh, as for reasons for this um, multi-decadal fluctuations in the Atlantic Basin, why did we have this sort of uh, hurricane, hurricane drought in the 1970s and 80s? The shaded curve here is major hurricane counts with some smoothing, showing this reduction in uh, hurricane counts in the 1970s and 80s compared to the decades before and after. And we see there, there are other uh, uh, variables in the Atlantic Basin which have also gone through a similar evolution. Uh, there's a change in vertical wind shear in the main development region, which has been inverted here. So uh, to sh it shows that uh, during this period of low uh, major hurricane activity, that was also a period of high vertical wind shear in the main development region. And it was also a period uh, of low values of the so-called Atlantic multi-decadal variability index, which uh, we have a curve here called AMOC fingerprint. That's a subsurface ocean fingerprint in the North Atlantic, which is trying to measure the strength of the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So there's evidence and observations, at least inferred evidence, that the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation has undergone these multi-decadal fluctuations, very similar, very correlated with major hurricane activity. In the bottom panel, we see uh, the red line, that's sea surface temperature in the main development region. We see it has the multi-decadal fluctuations, but it also has a trend. We're just not seeing that much of a trend uh, in these other metrics like vertical wind shear or in the, or in the major hurricane. In the major hurricanes, especially after one makes some adjustment uh, for um, uh, changes in observing uh, practices. So this uh, really beg begs the question, you know, what, what is the future going to bring? And there's this question of whether this multi-decadal fluctuation was caused by aerosols, changes in aerosols, or changes, or was it caused by changes in ocean circulation? And this is still a, a real point of debate in the climate uh, science community. Uh, I think there's no consensus. Perhaps both of these are contributing to that. It does have important implications for the future. If that rise in hurricane activity from 1980 on was caused by uh, decreases in aerosol forcing, then we don't expect that that particular uh, forcing to lead to any further increase because aerosols have sort of decreased to fairly low levels by now. Uh, so. If that were the big driver, we might expect hurricane activity to remain high for the next several decades, uh, but also being modulated by some type of greenhouse uh, warming signal. If it was internal variability and uh, changes in ocean circulation that was the dominant driver of these multi-decadal variations, then we might expect that we could even have a decline into another hurricane-type drought uh, associated with future changes in internal variability as we go into a negative a phase of this Atlantic multi-keel variability. Still, low, still an open question, as is the greenhouse gas influence, because even though we haven't been able to detect greenhouse gas influence yet, that doesn't mean it's not present. It may be just be below the noise level and getting ready to emerge. <clears throat> so here are, uh, here I showed some projections from a, quite a few models, um, from his own uh, sphere models mainly. Uh, this is a, a summary looking across the field at projections from a lot of different studies, a lot of different institutions. We've sort of gathered them all together into a type of consensus plot. These are the, the shading here. So we, we, we looked at the consensus projections for a two degrees Celsius global warming scenario, a greenhouse warming scenario. And we looked at tropical cyclone frequency. Uh, the frequency of category fours and fives, intensity of tropical cyclones, and the rain rate. And for each of these, uh, the blue shading indicates some of, sort of a range across models, and the dark blue is the median. So we see the median and the range is indicating some increase of intensity. It's about 3% for the Atlantic Basin, so not a huge increase. Uh, rainfall rates more like 15%, and a very clear signal. All the models seem to be getting above zero in that uh, case of tropical cyclone rain rate. So there's a very clear signal from models that rain, rain out of tropical cyclones is going to become more uh, intense in a warmer climate. As to frequency, uh, there's very scattered results. Uh, 
the models are not even really in agreement. The different studies are not really even in agreement about the sign of the change. Some indication of a possible increase in cat pores and vials, but a big range. And some indication of a consensus decrease in frequency, but again, a big range across studies. So uh, just recapping here, first of all, what does the historic Atlantic hurricane data show about trends? Uh, the key points I made, if we look at trends since 1901, no increase in U.S. landfalling hurricanes or major hurricane counts or power dissipation. So no real trend evident yet. Even though there has been an attributable human-caused sea surface temperature warming in the tropical Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, as there has been globally. Uh, it's human influence is, like, is likely contributed to uh, increasing precipitation extremes over many parts of the globe, including, uh, we suspect, in eastern Texas, uh, where we had Hurricane Harvey a few years ago having some really extreme precipitation, but a lot of that extreme precipitation from Harvey was uh, due to the fact that Harvey stalled out in the Houston area. So that raises the question, are we going to get more stall outs in the future? Well, there has been some indication of a slowing of tropical cyclone propagation speeds over the continental U.S. since 1901, uh, so a study by Jim Cosson, which I didn't show here. Uh, but the cause of that decrease has not yet been determined. We're not sure if we can blame that on greenhouse warming or something else. It's clear, though, that there's sea level rise ongoing along the um, U.S. coast, and that's increasing coastal flood risk. Um, and her, human influence is very likely the main driver of sea level rise, global sea level rise since 1971. Uh, looking at trends since 1950, we have these large multi-decadal variations in major hurricane counts and also in related metrics like vertical wind shear and sea surface temperatures in the main developed region. Also, it appears to be present in the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So there are these multi-decadal variations. What is the cause of these? Again, I mentioned aerosol forcing, internal climate, climate variability are the proposed mechanism. Uh, there's little long-term trend signal apparent. It's hard to pick such a signal out, uh, partly because of this large multi-decadal variability uh, that we don't really think is driven directly by greenhouse warming. There are a lot of trends since 1980 in a whole lot in various tropical cyclone metrics, increase in tropical cyclone frequency, increase in rapid intensification, intensities, proportion of category three, five storms, and so forth. Lots of things have increased since 1980. The point is, are, are these trends uh, representative of long-term trends uh, that could be then greenhouse uh, warming related, or are they more related to, these, to the multi-decadal variability, internal variability and aerosol reductions? So uh, we don't have all the answers yet, but it's clear that it's very difficult to detect uh, with with confidence, a greenhouse warming signal in these Atlantic hurricane metrics. And finally, I showed what the uh, state of the art of various studies uh, is projecting for a two degree Celsius global warming scenario. Increases in uh, storm surge risk due to sea level rise. That's a very one we're quite confident in. And you already see the sea level rising along uh, the US coast in those regions. Uh, tropical cyclone precipitation rates, we have medium to high confidence that's going to increase. Something like uh, 14, 15% for a two degree global warming scenario. That's about the rate at which tropical water vapor is projected to increase in a warming climate. So the atmosphere will be holding more water vapor as, as it warms up. And that leads to higher um, or more intense tropical cyclone rainfall rates. How about the storm intensities? So we have some studies that, uh, that are projecting, uh, or actually many studies projecting an increase in tropical cyclone intensities. Uh, the magnitude, there's a range of about uh, about 2 to, uh, actually it's minus 2 to 11 percent is the range we had across the studies. But the average is about 3 percent for a 2 degree global warming scenario, the average across the studies. Most of the studies, almost all of the studies are projecting an increase, but it's not yet uh, detectable uh, in the data uh, because of this large multi-decadal variability, at least in the Atlantic Basin. The proportion of tropical cyclones that reach these very intense levels, we have medium confidence that's going to increase. So uh, that's the fraction of storms getting to these very high levels. But uh, the number, actual number for that, uh, we have mixed results because uh, the models, many models like Euro's models and a number of others are projecting a decrease in the number of storms. So if you get a decrease in the total number of tropical cyclones and you get an increase in the fraction of them 
uh, reaching these high levels of intensity, then it's not really clear exactly what the number, what's going to happen to the number of Category 4s and 5s. And as I said, the total number of tropical cyclones, really mixed results across modeling studies. And also, we don't really have uh, clear evidence in the data uh, for a uh, detectable trend in that, at least at this point. So that's uh, that would be my summary, and happy to answer any questions in the, in the breakout period. Thanks. Hi, this is Chris Lancy. Can you hear me? All right, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss hurricanes with you all and a little bit about the database. And I'm going to try to fill in for my colleague, Ken Knapp, as well. Um, so my day job is the branch chief of our marine forecasters at the National Hurricane Center down in Miami. Uh, next slide, please. So the opportunity here to talk about uh, HERDAT, or the Atlantic Hurricane Database, is something that I've been involved with uh, since about the year 2000, um, both as reanalyzing the, the data itself, uh, but also quality controlling it every year and appending it uh, to uh, the existing records. Uh, next slide, please. So HERDAT itself, if you're not familiar with it, it's not a very uh, original acronym though, Hurricane Database, goes back to 1851 and goes up to 2023. It's for all tropical cyclones. So that would include tropical depressions, tropical storms, hurricanes, as well as these hybrid systems called subtropical storms. Um, we provide the positions to an accuracy, uh, I'm sorry, a resolution of uh, 0.1 degree latitude longitude. So that's about 10 kilometers. Uh, intensity is another word for maximum sustained surface winds. Uh, the resolution of that is 10 knots um, in the 19th century and 5 knots uh, the last 100 or so years. We also include in there central pressure uh, to the nearest millibar when observed. And then we include size information, that is how far from the center hurricane 50 knot and tropical storm force winds extend from the center. And then, uh, and that exists back 2004, so not, uh, not that many years. And then uh, just since 2021, we started um, including radius of maximum wind and doing a post-season assessment of that, as well as all the, the storms. Um, we do have a paper uh, that talks about the hurricane database and the format back in uh, 2013, a monthly weather view. Um, next slide, please. So there's a lot of applications for this in meteorology, climate science, and, and external as well. First off, we use it to validate our official National Hurricane Center track intensity and size forecast, as well as the models, the tools that we're using on a day-to-day -day basis. It's also used for climate trends. You saw some, some numbers and some time series shown um, by both uh, uh, Matt and Tom uh, about looking at long-term trends and, and variability. Uh, it's used by the engineering side of things for fi fi figuring a lot what appropriate building codes to put in for, for wind hazards. Uh, it's used by emergency managers to know what's the worst case hurricane they have to plan for and how often they may have strong hurricanes making landfall. And of course, it's also used by the insurance industry for uh, catastrophe modeling, which is the foundation for the observed part of the record. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing to keep in mind is that this objective record is subjectively determined and it's determined by the hurricane forecasters, whether it's Robbie Berg in the foreground uh, and Eric Blake seated next to him. It's a byproduct of operations. It's not the focus of what we do at the National Hurricane Center, but we understand it's got a lot of uses. And so a large part of the off season is spent in quality controlling, going through the positions, how strong they were, how large they were, whether it was tropical cyclone or a transition to an extra tropical system, as well as looking at any suspects that we didn't quite pull the trigger on and name during a season, but occasionally we'll name the system uh, 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 after the fact, like we did in January 2023, where we named the storm. But just keep in mind, this is this is it reflects the knowledge and the technology that was available to these folks, the forecasters at the National Hurricane Center. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the technology changes, because this database, HERDAT, it's used by so many different applications. Um, but if you're wanting to know changes in time, the database itself is very strongly affected by the technology itself. 
So you go back 100 years ago, all you had were weather stations and, and ships at sea. Uh, hurricane hunters started during World War II, the coastal radars in the 1950s, uh, satellites in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't until the early 70s that we had a way to take the satellite picture and make an estimate of where the storm is and how strong it is. And multiple additional technologies that really are allowing us to better um, diagnose how strong storms are and how large they are to a much higher degree of accuracy. You go back just a couple of decades and the uncertainty is much, much higher going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So there's also an effort uh, that I've been involved with to revise the hurricane data the database, to reanalyze it. And, uh, and the, the reason for doing that is, is multifold. Uh, the first of which is that there was a lot of both systematic and random errors that needed to be corrected as best we could. So for example, the 1938 Great New England hurricane was listed as a category three on the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale at landfall, yet its last wind before landfall was 85 knots or, or minimal category two. And so some of those reasons are because of changes in policy or changes in definition. So we wanted to go back and do a more of a homogeneous approach to, to come up with what's going on. Uh, also, there is missing storms where storms occurred, um, but they were not uh, identified at the time. And we we're able to, for example, with the early satellite pictures in the 1960s or 1970s, or additional ship measurements that were taken at the time, but were not um, available to the National Hurricane Center, we're adding in new storms. Another reason was that the HERDAT originally had no landfall information. So we've been building in specific landfall locations and times and, and characteristics uh, to fill in that. Uh, and then finally, that there's changes in our understanding of hurricanes over time. One example of which is that bottom right, which shows a drop wind sound. Those were launched starting in 1997. And by the year 2000, it allowed us to take winds that were very accurate at flight level by hurricane hunters and adjust them to 10 meters. Before not, uh, to the year 2000, we had no way to do that systematically. Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons that we're trying to revise the database. Problem is it's never gonna be perfect and it's always gonna be under sampling involved, uh, which, uh, which Tom had mentioned as well. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about this reanalysis and the, providing the, the website there if you want more information. Uh, as part of these efforts over the last couple of decades, we've added 35 years to the existing record where we took the, uh, the groundbreaking work by uh, Jose Fernandez Partagas and added that from 1851 to 1885 into the records. And we've systematically revised every storm and hurricane from 1886 to 1970 including Hurricane Andrew in, in 1992. We're working currently on the early 1970s, and we're hoping to have that made available to the community uh, sometime early in 2025. Uh, and I would make a pitch that these kind of reanalysis need to be conducted globally, uh, not just in the Atlantic Basin. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that's the main part of what I wanted to convey. Um, unfortunately, my colleague Ken uh, Knapp couldn't attend, so I'm going to cover for him as I am familiar with some of his work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Ken works at the National Center for Environmental Intelligence in, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, and has been uh, the maintainer of global hurricane databases. Next slide, please. So the main things that they do at NCEI, uh, there's four of them that relate to tropical cyclones. Uh, one is a global uh, best track or, uh, or, or um, uh, after the fact of hurricane data set uh, called IB tracks. Another one is a satellite based one called HERSAT. Uh, another one is taking um, the satellite imagery itself, which is HERSAT, and, and estimating the maximum winds from it. And then lastly, uh, the National Centers for Environmental Intelligence also do climate model modeling um, and monitoring. So I'm gonna mainly talk about the first and the third aspects that are done at NCEI here. Next slide, please. So IB tracks itself, uh, this is global database of historic tropical storms and hurricanes. And so there are national centers that are uh, provided by the World Meteorological Organization that have the official responsibility 
for providing tropical cyclone forecast information and maintaining databases. So for example, in the Northwest Pacific, it's the uh, Japanese Meteorological Agency that has that responsibility. In the Atlantic, it's the National Hurricane Center, as well as the Northeast Pacific, which is the National Hurricane Center and the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. Uh, there's also some reanalyses that are beginning to be done um, both in the Atlantic and elsewhere that are included in what's available in IB tracks. Next slide, please. So on the left is a slide that I showed just a few minutes ago. Uh, but again, it's, it's a highlight this database ain't perfect, and you cannot make assumptions that it's perfect. And it's not just an uncertainty, but it's an undersampling, going back in time, of frequency, and it's undersampling of how strong storms are. So on the right side are estimates of what the uncertainty is for different basins. For example, the southern Indian Ocean back in the 50s, 60s, 70s had a plus or minus 30 knots. That's two categories on the Saffir Simpson scale. So it's a very large uncertainty. But it's not just uncertainty, it's a low bias. Because often, if you have a ship that's saying it's 70 knots, category one hurricane, it could have been a lot worse, but they just didn't get into the worst of it. So please keep that in mind, um, that uh, the, there's large uncertainties and low biases the further back in time you go. Next slide, please. So the IB tracks, and this is this global best track database. Um, just like what I mentioned for the Atlantic, you have a position, you have an intensity that could be either maximum sustained winds or central pressure. You have the size of the storms. Um, what they also provide are gusts, eye diameter, some of the satellite derived intensity parameters, landfall, storm motion. So it's taking what we're providing for, as the National Hurricane Center and providing a, a bit more um, uh, involved information. Next slide, please. So it's a good point about how this differs. Best track refers to after the storm, after the season, when the hurricane forecasters aren't trying to just get the forecast out, they have time to do a post analysis. And so, so that's called the best track and that's done months afterwards. So for example, the 2023 hurricane season, we had that completed at the Hurricane Center, gave it to NCEI back in late April, uh, late March, early April. And so that takes a while, um, but there is a provisional data set that is available and NCEI updates that weekly. So if you need something right away, I would suggest going to NCEI on that. But if you want the best, most polished uh, information, then you, then you do have to wait a few months after the storm for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the third time you're seeing this slide. Uh, again, uh, the HERDAP and the IV tracks are uh, informed by the technology that's available. That means it's very heterogeneous. It's not a homogeneous time series that you get, for example, of number of name storms. Um, however, with using the satellite imagery that's archived at NCEI, they have a, a technique called the advanced Dvorak technique where you can estimate the peak winds. And so they actually have a beautiful homogeneous record that goes back to the 1980s globally of how strong hurricanes were, uh, which is an, uh, a really important way that one can uh, take a look at time series and not be plagued by the, uh, the technology itself. Next slide, please. So just to wrap up, uh, the IB tracks provided by uh, NCEI is a global database, both operational, that is, you know, short-term availability on a weekly basis, as well as polished at the end of the hurricane season. Um, and they have this uh, satellite data set called HERSAT, and then using the advanced Dvorak technique with HERSAT, you get a, a nice time series uh, to look at how hurricanes are changing over time. Uh, so it's a nice partnership between what we do operationally in the National Weather Service at the Hurricane Center as what they do within uh, the NESDIS part of NOAA at NCEI. Um, next slide. I think that's the last one. All right, everyone, welcome back. That was the fastest five-minute break I have experienced. 
Um, all right, so we are going to transition into our breakouts. And the breakouts are really helpful to the NOAA team as part of the IPG effort. Uh, the reason this is, is we, one, had the opportunity to have our industry participants uh, be on this call. And since we had your time, we thought it would make sense that we actually get into a conversation and dialogue with you. Um, so on the screen, you see the five different groups. One, two, three, four, five, retail, architecture, and engineering, insurance, reinsurance, energy, and all others. Um, you will be broken up into different groups as part of the group breakout. So I want to remind you at the bottom right of your Google screen, there is a triangle, square, and circle. Uh, if you hover over it, it says activities. In that area, there is an option for breakout rooms. Most all of you have already been pre-identified and determined into your respective groups, so you don't really have to worry about that. Um, my colleagues in the backstage chatter have already made assignments. So as soon as I stop talking, you will be moved over into the different groups. And there's about 28 minutes, and you will get a little bit of a warning. You do have group moderators, so thank you to my colleagues, Russ Vose, Adam Smith, Vanessa Escobar, and Liz Cox. They will give you a one minute heads up before you will be basically automatically forced back into this main group breakout. You do have, next slide please. Um, just a reminder, as I stop talking, you will have a screen pop up that says join a breakout session. You hit join, please don't hit cancel. That makes it a little bit interesting for us on the back end. And when the group breakout is done, it will um, give you the prompt to join the main call. So you do the second one at the end of your breakout. Next. All right, so our hurricane subject matter experts, Matt, Tom, Hero, and Chris, are going to flow in and out of your breakout rooms. So all of the groups will have a chance to interact with all of them. Now, it could get a little funky in the sense that we have to monitor the time pretty quickly. So. Um, you know, I encourage dialogue, I encourage conversation, whatever you don't have a chance to cover in your group breakout, please, please, please make a note of it. Put it in the chat here, put it in the Q&A here, please email us and we will add it to the notes as part of a question that was raised and a response that we will type and provide back as part of the summary. Okay. So with that, I think we are going to transition over into our groups. All right. So we did a speed interaction between NOAA climate hurricane science expert and business and industry. Thank you for giving us this time and patience and grace to allow our scientists to interact with all of you. We know we didn't finish, and that gives us all the opportunity to reconnect. Um, in the retail segment, we had a lot of very specific and targeted information asks. So I'm very pleased to say that we've got uh, information that we can take back to build IPG. We did have initial plans to do a group breakout readout, um, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time and end promptly. So the plan is we will summarize our slides, put the key points in the slides, which will be made available on the website along with this uh, presentation. And uh, if we could just go back to the resources page for a second. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank everyone and really just appreciate the uh, frank conversation, the openness, the relationship building that we hope to fodder here. Um, and also recognizing that when we know or put information together when it comes to details of history, data, reports, and future projections, we think about all industries. And each industry is different. So part of our complexity is how do we reach and provide information to many of the different industry sectors, knowing this is how the science information is captured and summarized. Therein lies our work. And so Adam, Vanessa, myself, and Russ Bose We'll be working with our industry partners to tailor the information that we have available and make it most appropriate and relevant to the industry. Okay, so be on the lookout as we will reach out to you in the future. 
Uh, there's a lot of information we shared today. It has, cap it has been captured in the chat feature, but these are some key resources that we want to leave with you. There are many more. There's a lot of information at NOAA. Um, so at this point, I would like to, next slide, uh, pass it over to Mike and uh, have him say a few words of thank you and just recognize the team. Yeah, absolutely. So let me say a blanket thank you first off, because I guarantee you I will forget somebody if I start trying to run down the list. So uh, I do not mean to do that. Please, no slight uh, intended. But I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank our organizers. I want to thank those of you who came and attended and provided such great input um, that we can move forward on. I also want to leave you uh, on this slide with a way to get back in touch with us. Um, as Jenny mentioned, uh, you know, she's taking the point for us as the retail sector lead, Russ for architecture and engineering and Adam for reinsurance. If you have, uh, if you're part of that industry, you have questions specific to those, please reach out directly to them. Uh, if you have other questions or you just don't know who to go to or you forget uh, who those other people are, reach out to me. I'm happy to, to direct people uh, the right way so uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, speakers, for your time and, and putting the slides together and such great information uh, passed along. I, I really do appreciate it. And thank you for the flexibility as we tried out some of these things like moving into to breakout sessions where we were muted. You know, it's all a learning experience. Uh, thank you for being a little bit of a guinea pig for us uh, in some of this. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to Jenny. All right, thank you. Um, so we have some work cut out for us as we look out into the future for the next couple of weeks and months as part of IPG. For my industry folks, if you are really anxious and curious what we are up to, the plan is we will be updating this website pretty regularly. Uh, you should be hearing either from Russ, Vanessa, uh, Adam, or myself, depending on what industry sector you're part of, and uh, we, we've got a lot of requirements to put on the retail side, so I'm really excited to roll up the sleeves. Uh, this is not the end of our conversation and engagement. We do want to share with you the key takeaways. So give us about a week, and the recording of the key takeaways and the detailed summary will all be available here on this website that you can see in the chat. So for now, thank you until we meet again.